some techniques for deciding between different probability distributions uh, for some given data set. We're going to discuss the technique of constructing probability plots, or actually I think a more uh, appropriate term is uh, probability percentile plots. So probability Uh, probability, <laughs> uh, probability percentile plots, which you might uh, hear as uh, PP plots. This is a visual method used to check whether a data set could plausibly have been drawn from a particular distribution. There are actually statistical procedures like uh, like null hypothesis testing type procedures for deciding whether a distribution is appropriate for a particular data set. Um, that said, the uh, probability plot procedure is quite popular and um, it's uh, relatively simple. You don't need to use any uh, hypothesis testing frameworks for it. Uh, it's uh, there, there are some disadvantages to using the hypothesis testing approach for deciding whether a data set is appropriate. Uh, that uh, a visual technique like this doesn't suffer from. Uh, it is somewhat uh, is ad hoc the term that I would want to use. I mean, it's not a precise method since at the end of the day, what you're going to be doing is making some judgment call. But it's also possible that the precision that you get from hypothesis testing is a little false anyway. And just the way that you decide on a distribution, a hypothesis testing framework is a little, like it's a little unsatisfying. Like it's, it's it kind of operates contrary to how we would advise people practice statistics. So this is, a, this is a genuinely good method for deciding whether a data set seems to be from a particular distribution. So in essence, what we do is we compare the observed sample percentiles with the percentiles of a data set if it had come from a chosen distribution. And if the relationship between the observed and the theoretical distributions is linear, uh, the distributional assumptions seem reasonable. If there is a nonlinear relationship, then th that, that assumption seems unlikely. And in addition, if you examine very closely the plot, you can probably determine why exactly that distribution is inappropriate for that data set. Um, now, when we were working in the discrete case, you were able to uh, argue that a certain distribution is appropriate for the phenomena we're trying to model. And uh, I disagree now, after having written these notes, because I wrote these notes a few years ago. Um, I disagree now that it is impossible to develop some arguments for... Uh, particular continuous distributions because often certain continuous random variables do have justifications uh, and there's like and um, well not just justifications but there is in fact a narrative for many of those distributions as to how they emerge uh, but at the same time though for many physical phenomena you cannot use that justification and even then the the uh, continuous distributions are just they're just much more abstract they're just much they they don't have these nice combinatorial explanations that the uh, discrete distributions do so often if we want to decide what distribution is appropriate for some observed data set uh, we are obligated to use methods like this here is an example of what a probability plot looks like before i keep going uh, we have, oops, I need to change to a pen. We have a Cartesian plane. And along this Cartesian plane, we have uh, theoretical quantiles along the x-axis. It doesn't matter which is x or y, but I think traditionally it's the x-axis that contains theoretical. So theoretical quantiles. So the theoretical quantiles are the quantiles that you would expect to see if the sample came from some proposed distribution. And for the, uh, the uh, sample quantiles, 
So we have the sample quantiles. Uh, oh, come on. Oh, come on. Be cooperative. Be cooperative, you stupid computer. Oh, darn it. <laughs> okay, so. Okay, sorry. I just, I have to write sideways for this. And uh, my computer doesn't want to cooperate because it's super cheap. All right, sample. Uh, so we have sample quantiles. These are the quantiles that we actually uh, observed in the sample. So then we plot a theoretical quantile, like for example, the fifth percentile. Uh, well, okay, so we plot the theoretical fifth percentile and the observed fifth percentile. The theoretic, theoretical 10th percentile and the observed 10th percentile. Uh, the theoretical 50th percentile and the observed 50th percentile. All the way through uh, all the percentiles in our sample. And uh, we create a scatter plot of those percentiles. So something looking like this. Um, and uh, let, let's... this. So here's just for some uh, fictitious data set. And what we hope to see is that the theoretical and the observed percentiles are very close to a line, a straight line. If that is the case, you're never going to actually get an exact line. But if it's the case that the theoretical and observed quantiles are close to a line, it seems reasonable to say that this sample came from this distribution. If this is not the case, then uh, we would probably suggest that well, it doesn't seem reasonable to say that the theoretical distribution we proposed is the distribution for the data set. So this is an example of what we want to see. This is a good uh, PP plot. Uh, this suggests that our theoretical distribution is appropriate for the data that we are seeing. Uh, now let's compare that to bad cases. So here are some example of plots that suggest that the theoretical distribution is not appropriate for the sample. So let's see, uh, we got a red, ourselves a red line and we could have, for example, the data set has an S shape, although there's a couple different S shapes that we could possibly see. So uh, here's one potential S shape that we could see. Uh, let's create another one. We could have a different looking S shape. Do, 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 And we could see yet a third possibility. Actually, there's a number of possibilities that we could in fact see. But here is another possibility where instead of an S shape, uh, we get some uh, some uh, U looking shape. Something like uh, this. Yeah, yeah, this, this could be appropriate. And in fact, reading these plots, we can decide why exactly a proposed theoretical distribution is inappropriate for a data set. So for example, uh, let's consider uh, first this case that I've got in a blue box. Does the undo button work now? Oh, for goodness sakes. Oh, this is ridiculous. Okay, so I don't, I don't know why. I think it's my screen. Um, although can I, uh, good grief. What is going on? I don't, I don't know why the undo button isn't working. Okay. So, um, what's wrong with this one? Well, remember that the X axis is the theoretical and the Y axis is the observed. So what I'm seeing here is, uh, so for our theoretical, we have a larger one, but the observed is smaller than what we would expect. Um, so the observed, uh, the, the observed percentile is, uh, smaller than what we would have, uh, smaller in magnitude than what we would expect, uh, from the theoretical distribution. And on the ex other extreme, on the right hand side, we have a theoretical percentile that's smaller than what we would expect, uh, in magnitude than the. No, 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 no. It's larger than what we expect in magnitude than the observed uh, sample percentile. Uh, actually, that's that's true in both directions. So on this side, we have a theoretical that's larger than what we actually observed in magnitude, that is. Uh, uh, and uh, the same on the opposite end as well. So 
this is a situation where uh, the theoretical distribution has tails that are heavier than what you would expect than what we actually saw in the sample distribution. So, uh, so the, the theoretical tails are too heavy. So this would be a situation that you would expect to see if, um, uh, let's say that you had uh, your data was following a normal distribution, but uh, well, okay, you so you think that your data follows a normal distribution, but it actually came from say uh, a uniform distribution, which has very light tails, and that they go straight to zero. Um, this would be a situation you'd expect to see. So your tails in your sample are not as heavy as a theoretical distribution would suggest. Let's look instead at this uh, other plot. This seems to be suffering from the opposite situation where uh, the theoretical quantile is somewhat small, but the observed quantile is larger in magnitude than what we would expect. And uh, that's the case on both the lower end and the upper end. So this uh, middle plot has the opposite uh, problem where the theoretical tails The theoretical tails are too light. So this would be a plot that you'd expect to see if you think your data came from a normal distribution, but it actually came from a, um, a T distribution or a Cauchy distribution. And uh, this plot on the right-hand side, uh, on the far right, which we're going to box in green, what's wrong with this one? Well, uh, if we look at the left-hand side, uh, we have a theoretical um, quantile that's much smaller than what we actually, no, that's much larger than what we actually observed in the sample, whereas on the left-hand side, the theoretical quantile is much larger in magnitude, no, is much smaller than what we in magnitude than what we observed in the sample. So this would be a situation where um, the left, uh, so... Uh, left-hand tails are too heavy, uh, are too heavy in the theoretical distribution. And uh, right-hand tails are too light. So this would be a, uh, a plot that you would see if um, your this would be a plot that you would see if you were to attempt to fit a normal distribution to an exponential data set, uh, because the exponential distribution will have uh, heavier tails than the normal distribution on the right hand side. It's more right skewed, whereas on the left hand side, uh, eventually, like the tail on the left-hand side for the exponential goes to zero. Like, it, it will drop off to zero, whereas the normal distribution will have heavier tails. So this would be a case where your data set is at some level too right-skewed than what your uh, theoretical distribution it suggests. So, so the observed is more right-skewed. Ugh. Oh, come on. Be cooperative. Right skewed. So you need to use a distribution that's more right skewed than what you actually uh, attempted. All right. For this chapter, I'm going to create PP plots, or sometimes they're called QQ plots for quantile quantile. Um, but... Um, but I'm going to create these plots. Um, oh yeah, oh yeah. They're, so here they're called Q, QQ plots. Um, so yeah, I I really got to get these words straightened out. Anyway, um, here we see one for. Okay, where, where was I going with this? In this lecture, I'm going to be creating these plots by hand. Uh, for the most part, I'm going to show how to make them by hand but realistically you're always going to use software. So you so in this case I created a fictitious two fictitious data sets. One comes from a normal distribution, one comes from a uniform distribution, 
and I compare um, the uh, uh, and basically I'm comparing against the normal distribution using the function QQ norm QQ line is a function that will create the line that we see in these probability plots so in this uh, first plot I am comparing a data set that is in fact normal to the normal distribution we do see a largely linear pattern so it seems that the normal distribution is appropriate and then it's in the second data set we have a uniform distribution uh, being compared to the normal distribution and this is where we see that first case of an S shape that is suggesting that the uh, sample quantiles are are well basically the tails are too light in the sample for the normal distribution to be appropriate um, all of these data sets are basically a judgment call whenever you're looking at a QQ plot it's always a judgment call as to what shape you're seeing um, but uh, and, and whether the distribution seems appropriate like to me I say eh, linear enough when I look at this data set um, whereas this data set I see the tails I see that the tails are actually rather heavy um, it's a bit clearer to see if we were to allow this uh, plot to go on how he just how heavy those tails are whereas in this situation the tails are actually not all that heavy at all um, but yeah this is a situation where uh, like for example the theoretical quantiles should be um, around a negative like we should be seeing something around negative two to two but this data set is uh, never extending beyond zero and one so we get a shape looking like this um, now in this uh, so realistically we are always going to be using software to create these plots because there will be like a thousand points and there's no way we will ever make that by hand that said in this lecture I am going to make these plots by hand because I think it's still good practice to see the process of how these plots are created um, uh, and uh, and thus when you actually see the the uh, software generated plots you're able to understand and appreciate them better um, then and I and I'm just resistant to uh, telling people here's a plot look at that plot and stuff like that I would much rather people have a deeper understanding as to what it is they're looking at so we're gonna create some of these plots by hand and then never do it again <laughs> because we're just gonna have software do it so um uh right so suppose we have a sample x1 through xn uh we will create and this is the first time since uh, chapter one we've gone back to having a sample so we have the sample x1 to xn here is the ordered sample uh so this this right here was unordered whereas this is ordered uh, we call ri the 100th times i minus 0.5 over n sample percentile. So these are the sample percentiles according to some percentile rule. Um, it's probably disagreeing with the other rules that we've had for coming up with percentiles because there's a thousand different rules for coming up with for defining sample percentiles. So let's uh, construct a probability plot. If we're going to do this, we're going to do the following. First, we need to find the we're, we're going to find the theoretical the, the percentiles of the theoretical distribution from i equals one to n. Eta is that a uh, percentile function, and we are going to uh, oh finally the undo button is working. What a what a concept! All right, we're going to find these theoretical percentiles using our percentile function plugging in uh, the plugging in for our percentile I minus 0 0.5 over n remember that I ranges from 1 to n okay and then we are going to plot this theoretical percentile against its uh, sample counterpart on a Cartesian grid you do those two things and uh, see what you get. Hopefully your data fell along a line and your guess as to the appropriate distribution is correct. So if the theoretical distribution is a normal distribution, we even are going to call this a normal probability plot. We're just doing this because most of the time what you're checking for is whether your data is normal or not. Because the normal distribution is so important and so commonly assumed that it's um, it, we're often just comparing against the normal distribution almost well most of the time 
Most of the time, you're comparing against the normal distribution. Uh, so decide via a judgment call on your part that other people are welcome to argue with. Um, if the relationship between the theoretical and observed percentiles appears linear, and if the answer is yes, then the distribution is a good fit. Otherwise, it's a bad fit. And you may look at that plot to decide why it seems to be a bad fit. So here is our first example. Uh, here we have five data points, and we're going to create a probability plot to determine if it is plausible the data came from an exponential distribution with a uh, mean parameter one. Okay, so the corresponding percentiles, according to that, um, according to that i minus 0.5 over n rule, are going to be. So we'll write the percentiles here. Uh, the first number is the the first ordered number is the tenth percentile. Then we have the twentieth, the thirtieth. No, 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 no. Not 10, 20, 30. Uh, it's going to be 10, 30, 50, 70, and 90. These are the sample percentiles. Our percentile function is eta p, which is negative uh, ln of 1 minus p. So here we're going to make another table containing the percentile uh, as our, so that'll be like our header column. And then we have the theoretical, theoretical percentile and the sample percentile. We're basically recreating the table that we have here. So we got 10, 30, 50, 70, and 90. So uh, we can basically re, uh, rewrite the sample percentile. So we got 0 0.22, uh, 0 0.26, uh, 0 0.97, uh, 1.04, and 1.59. So those are just our sample percentiles that we're writing down again. As for the theoretical, the first number that we're going to have is 0 0.11 which if you're wondering what that number is, that's going to be negative, oops, that's negative ln of 0 0.1. All right, and then our next uh, percentile is 0 0.36, which if you're wondering what exactly that is, where that, where that number came from, that's negative ln uh, 0.3. So we're just using our sample percentile function. And then we have 0 0.69, uh, 1.20 and 2.30 for our final percentiles. Okay, and then we're going to construct our our plot. So we have our theoretical for the x for the x fat axis, our sample. So s a uh, m p l E. Oh, that's pretty good for sideways writing. Um, so we've got our sample. Let's see. We've got, let's increment by 0. 0.5 in either direction. So one, two, three, four, five. So this will be 0. 0.5, and the last number will be 2.5. And uh, doing the same in the y direction for five. So we got 2.5 here and 0. 0.5 here. Okay, so our first point to plot is 0 0.11 and 0 0.22. Uh, so that's going to be uh, about here. Then we got 0 0.36 and 0 0.26. Uh, that's about here. Uh, then we got 0 0.69 and 0 0.97. That's going to be about here. Uh, 0. No, 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 no. 1.20 and 1.04. So that's going to be about here. And 2.30 against 1.59. So that's about here. Okay. And uh, for our straight line that we're comparing against, we got something looking like this. And to me... My judgment is that this is a good fit, that this is pretty linear. So I'm going to say that this is a good fit.
so to me, it seems appropriate to say that the data set did come from an ex exponential distribution with parameter one. Uh, and I also know for a fact that it was created by such a distribution uh, because I'm the one who made it. So, um, and here, by the way, is some R code. Uh, we could, this, by the way, is how you would create a theoretical, uh, a, Q, a PP or QQ plot in general. Here's our data set. Here we get the theoretical distributions, uh, uh, theoretical uh, percentiles using QEXP. Notice that this right here corresponds to I minus 0.5 divided by N. Hence, obtaining these uh, theoretical percentiles. So then we can uh, use the function QQplot, uh, give it the theoretical for X and the observed for the Y, and then here's some other parameters for a nice plot, and then just create QQ line where the distribution we're computing, uh, comparing against is QEXP. All right. So here it is, uh, the resulting plot. And yeah, that seems to pretty much be what we created before. And to me, this looks like a straight line. And I think most people would say this looks like a straight line. So it would suggest that the exponential one is an appropriate distribution. Okay. Um, now, the thing is, the procedure that we just described is a procedure for checking whether the data set came from a particular distribution. In other words, it's exactly the exponential distribution with parameter one. And unfortunately, that's not what we often want to do because often we want to check whether it's whether the data came from a member of a family of distributions. For example, the exponential with mean parameter mu. So in other words, we actually often don't want to specify what the parameter is in order to check whether the data came from that distribution. Um, often what we want to know is, if we like did it came come from this um distribution and we just don't know what the parameters exactly are so we know that there is some let's say exponential distribution or normal distribution or beta distribution or weibull distribution it came there is some distribution that would fit it from that family we just don't know what the parameters are and that's a more difficult problem to solve um if we now that said there are ways around it a little bit if we say that theta one is a location parameter and theta two is a scale parameters in general okay in general if we have a location parameter and a scale parameter um okay so for starters what are those parameters what it what is a location scale we say theta one is a location parameter and theta two is a scale parameter if the cdf depends on x minus theta one divided by theta two um, so another intuitively theta one is a parameter that will rigidly shift the distribution and theta two is a parameter that will scale the distribution. So you've seen X minus theta one over theta two before you've seen something like this. Uh, think of X minus mu divided by Sigma. You see that that's showing up in the PDF or, and in the CDF of uh, normal random variables and thus mu is a shift parameter uh, so or this is a location parameter and this is a scale parameter and additionally you do see it in the exponential distribution as well because the exponential distribution it's a uh, cdf uh, looks like this one minus e negative x over mu because of the x over mu part, you could say that mu is a scale parameter. So actually, so the mean is not always a location parameter. In the case of the exponential distribution, the mean is a scale parameter. It controls the scale of the resulting distribution. So if you have uh, parameters like this, then you can like uh, estimate the location parameter, estimate the scale parameter, and then uh, recompute your data set where you subtract out the location parameter that you estimated and divide by the scale parameter that you estimated and then create a, com a, a PP plot for that, for, for that in which your locate where in the PP plot in your theoretical distributions, the scale parameter is set to one and your location parameter is set to zero. 
So what you're basically doing is you're standardizing your observations so that in the sample, the location parameter is effectively zero and the scale parameter is effectively one. Right? Now, the thing is not all uh, parameters are uh, location parameters or scale parameters. So for example, I've been mentioning repeatedly shape parameters in the previous videos. And shape parameters are neither location or scale parameters. And you're going to have to do something else in order to attempt to estimate a shape parameter. Um, it's actually going to be much more difficult to estimate those. Now that said, there are a number of parameters that we have seen that do fall into uh, this dichotomy of location and scale. So for example, uh, let's create a small table. So we have a distribution. We have whether a parameter is a location parameter and whether the parameter is a scale parameter. So in the case of a normal distribution with mean mu and standard deviation sigma, uh, mu is a location parameter and sigma is a scale parameter. In the case of a Poisson distribution uh, with mean mu, act, no, actually, no, 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 no. This is discrete. We don't have such discussions with discrete distributions. Okay. Um, let's say in the case of a uniform uh, where our lower parameter is A and our upper parameter is A plus 1. A plus 1. All right, then we we do have a location parameter, which would be A, but we don't have a scale parameter. Um, now, that said, that was for a particular uniform distribution. In general, the uniform distribution specified by its minimum and its maximum, uh, the minimum and the maximum are neither location or scale parameters. However, you could reparameterize and rewrite a uniform distribution in terms of, let's say, its medium, median and its range, in which case the median would be a location parameter and the range would be a scale parameter. And I'm going to leave that as an exercise to you to see if you can figure out uh, how to rewrite the uniform distribution in this way. Uh, let's say, let's take next an exponential distribution. And the exponential distribution is uh, specified by its mean parameter mu. It does not have a location parameter, but it does have a scale parameter, which is the mean. Uh, the gamma distribution. Uh, the gamma distribution has uh, a shape parameter alpha and a scale parameter beta. Beta is a scale parameter and there is no location parameter because alpha is not a location parameter. Alpha is a shape parameter. And the log normal distribution where you have mu and sigma as the parameters, it has neither a location nor a scale parameter. That said, if you wanted to check whether your data was actually log normally distributed or not, what you would do is take the log of that data and then see if the log of your data is actually following a normal distribution. And so the log normal case is actually quite, is, is perfectly fine. Um, and actually the gamma case, in the case of the gamma, we also would have uh, the uh, Vable case because we basically wrote that in alpha and beta too. And alpha and beta are also working as the same, are also working the same way. So that's, that's also covered. And the beta distribution is not covered by any of this because Alpha is not a location parameter or bit or scale parameter. It's a shape parameter. Same thing with beta. A and B are minimum and maximum parameters, so they are not going to be location or scale. But I do think that you could probably reparameterize the beta distribution in terms of um, like maybe the midpoint of the, yeah, maybe the midpoint of its support and the range of its support. And that would probably be a location scale situation. So you could probably reparameterize it if you wanted to. That said, you're still left with what are you going to do about the shape parameters? None of this tells you what you're going to do about the shape parameters. Although, <coughs> excuse me, um, I do have this note here. Uh, this note here suggests what a real, <laughs> what, what real statisticians would do 
in the case of shape parameters. You would just you'd use some procedure like um, a maximum likelihood estimation or something to attempt to estimate them and then see if and, and then see what happens. But there are some wrinkles to it. All right, enough about that. Our final example for this chapter, construct a probability plot to check if the following data set was plausibly generated by a normal distribution. Okay, so for this data set, um, I'm just going to tell you that I computed the sample mean for this data set, and that sample mean is going to be uh, 90.218. Uh, but for but for maximum fun, do all of this without ever touching a calculator. <laughs> and then the sample variance, uh, I managed to compute that, um, and uh, it was a uh, oh boy, twelve thousand four hundred thirty six point oh five. <laughs> okay. So the sample standard de uh, oops uh, the sample standard deviation was 111.52. All right. So we're going to create an additional table. So we've got uh, how many observations? This, by the way, if you don't want to see all of the work that's going into creating this thing by hand, this is definitely a part you're welcome to skip. Uh, but we've got 10 observations, so uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. All right, so our percentiles, theoretical or otherwise, are going to be the 5%, uh, 10%, and I'm just going to drop percentage signs after this. Um, so we got 5, 10. Uh, oh, I also want to get rid of this too. Uh, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Uh, no, 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 5, 15, 25, 35, 45, 55, 65, 75. 85, 95. All right, there we go. That's better. Um, next up. Uh, let's go ahead and write down the theoretical percentiles. We're going to be comparing... Uh, we're writing down the theoretical percentiles of the standard normal distribution. Because we actually don't really care whether the data came from a normal distribution with mean... 100 and standard deviation 20 or a normal distribution with standard deviation uh, 2 and mean 5,000. We don't care about the values of the parameters. We want to check whether this data came from a normal distribution. Any normal distribution, regardless of the parameter values. Okay, then. So uh, the corresponding theoretical percentiles, ooh, we're going to have to zoom in for this, for the norm, the standard normal distribution are negative one point. Eh, I have in my notes up to uh, three decimal places, and that's not a good idea. So negative one point six five, uh, negative one point oh four, uh, negative zero point six seven, negative zero point three nine. Uh, negative 0 0.13. And then we cross over the y-axis and everything is symmetric. So we'll get 0 0.13 and 0 0.39 and basically everything that we had before but switching the sign. So 0 0.67, uh, 1.04, 1 and then 1.65. All right, so those are the theoretical quantiles for the standard normal uh, distribution. Uh, here is our observed uh, sample quantiles uh, rewritten down, 8.89, uh, 25.86, 
and then 26.47. Uh, 32.16, uh, 34.07, 37.49, we don't have a nice symmetry here to exploit, uh, 86.80, and then we've got 125.02, uh, 146.36, and finally 379.06. So now we need the uh, standardized sample percentile. So ri minus x bar divided by s. We get negative 0.73. Uh, negative 0 0.58, uh, negative 0 0.57, negative 0 0.52. Now let's see, how well are these lining up? Let's make some blue lines to try and cut stuff up. So we've got this as a column this as a column. All right, uh, negative 0 0.52, negative 0 0.50, uh, negative 0 0.03. Okay, let's mark those columns, then keep going. Oh, wait, oh, 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 uh, I think I, Sorry about that, I uh, skipped ahead a little bit. So we got negative 0 0.47 and then negative 0 0.03. And then uh, 0 0.31, 0 0.50, and 2.59, okay. All right, before continuing on, what you would want to compare is the red row, the row that I just underlined in red, to the uh, dark blue row. Those are going to be what we're plotting. So this uh, middle row, we can almost ignore. So we'll put a, a dash through that. Uh, we can basically ignore that because what we got was the standardized values, and that's what we're going to use for our plot. And just just by eyeballing this, it, it this doesn't look good for the normal distribution. Um, it seems like the normal distribution is inappropriate for our sample because like it just doesn't seem to match. But let's let's go ahead and create the plot. Um, like that's why we're here. So. We're going to have an x-axis and a, or a y-axis and an x-axis, uh, and we'll have things range from zero to three. So this will be negative three, this will be three, this will be three, this will be three, and uh, I think I'm going to have how many tick marks? Six. So six tick marks. Okay, one, two, uh, three, and then tick mark, tick mark, tick mark, tick mark, tick mark. All right. So let's uh, plot the first pair of points. That's going to be negative 1.65 and negative 0 0.73. So negative uh, 1.65 for uh, the x-axis is about here and uh, negative, um, and then uh, we have negative 0 0.73. So that's going to be about here. And our next point is, uh, what do we got? We got negative 1.04 and negative 0 0.58. So 
negative 1.04, negative 0.58 is about here. And then keep going like that. So we're going to have negative 0 0.67 and negative 0 0.57. So that's going to be uh, about here. Uh, negative, um, let's see. Uh, negative 0 0.39 and negative 0 0.52 is about here. Um, negative 0 0.13 and negative 0 0.50 is about here. Um, negative 0, 0 0.13 and negative 0 0.47 is about here. Um, uh, 0 0.39 and negative 0 0.03 is about here. Um, uh, 0 0.67 and 0 0.31 is about here. Uh, 1.04 and 0 0.57 is about here. And uh, 1.645 and 2.59 is about here. And the straight line of this plot is the uh, red line. So that's going to look uh, uh, something like this. So the red line is the straight line that ideally this data set would fit well, and it doesn't. Uh, instead, it has this uh, uh, curvy looking shape. I don't remember what exactly the uh, uh, the random variable was that I was attempt that I actually generated, but I do know that it wasn't the normal. It might have been a Cauchy. Uh, anyway, let's uh, have a look at what R came up with when we fed it this data set, and it's getting something pretty similar. Um, like it looks roughly linear in the uh, in in the pink region. If we only had the pink region, like things look not great but not bad per se but it's like one point that causes a major problem and i guess admittedly if you were to take this this uh this uh line and extend it out like there is one point that doesn't look super great but it's really just one observation uh one observation is a massive outlier and it causes problems I think, I'm pretty sure that the distribution that I used to model this was the Cauchy distribution. The Cauchy distribution is one of those distributions that doesn't even have a mean. The tails for the Cauchy distribution are extremely heavy. So, yeah, you end up with a plot looking like this. The normal distribution is not going to be the appropriate one. Okay, so that wraps up this section. Uh, I guess, yep, chapter 5 is the next one. So that can, concludes our study of uh, univariate probability for the most part. Well, I don't know. I suppose chapter 5 when we're talking about IID random variables, it's still essentially univariate. Um, so, but yeah, that, that, that concludes this chapter. And um, I will see you later when discussing uh, joint probability distributions and random samples where we talk first about having two random variables that are jointly distributed and then after talking about that, talking about um, uh, IID samples. So this is the chapter where we start moving away from probability, which is what we've been talking about uh, up to this point. Um, except for chapter one, all we've been talking about is probability. We're going to start moving from probability to back into statistics. But now, when moving into statistics, we now have the probabilistic tool set to be able to evaluate statistical methods. All right, so that concludes this uh, this uh, chapter, this lecture, and uh, I uh, I wish you all the best. Oh wait, 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 wait! No, I'm not done yet. So I once had a student um, ask me once, "What do you do when you've tried all the distributions and none of them seem to work?" And it was like, "Oh, that's." Uh, that's adorable. What an adorable question. We try all the distributions and none of them work. I My response to that basically is, well, I mean, I guess that's... Um, so there's the first response, which is, 
Um, data doesn't necessarily have to follow any distribution that we specify, so you could possibly develop a new one. But like the the bigger point is, did you really try all the distributions? Uh, let's see. So who is the uh, so Lemus? Yes, yeah. So my question is, did you really try all the distributions? Because there's a lot of them. There's a lot of distributions that we did not cover in this class. So there is this paper that appeared in the American Statistician. Uh, let's see. So let's mark this page. So the paper is um, Univariate Distribution Relationships uh, by Lawrence Lemus and Jacqueline uh, McQuiston. And uh, what did I... Okay, so, uh, and they had this interesting plot in this data set uh, with a bunch of distributions in it. Lots of distributions in it. And they have this, uh, what they're doing is they're describing all the relationships amongst random variables. So, for example, uh, they're saying that the Poisson distribution with parameter mu, if you take your mean to approach infinity, uh, your your mu parameter to approach infinity, then what you get is a normal random variable. Or um, we have uh, a discrete uniform being a special, uh, so be, suggesting the rectangular distribution, beta binomial suggesting a rectangular distribution. So they are also including like some distributions or special cases of others. Uh, so yeah, this is a case where the non-central t distribution, um, the t distribution is a special case of the non-central t. Um, you have a Cauchy uh, random variable producing uh, standard Cauchy random variables and all this stuff. Um, yeah, they they um, they've got like a gazillion different relationships for so many random variables. And it's like, did you really try all of these? Did you really try every single one of these? And furthermore, this isn't even all of them. There's a lot of random variables. I have a book that I bought um, that's just containing like that's just. All the book contains are distributions for different random variables, and there's a gazillion of them that are not listed here. Like the book is like uh, 400 pages long or something, and all it does is list out distributions. There's a lot of distributions, so <laughs> far more than what we discussed here. So yeah, that's uh, that's basically my response to that. Did you really try all of them? There's a lot of them. Um, all right, and some of these are like essentially statistical distributions where they may not be. So interesting as in modeling real world phenomena, but they're more interesting as describing the behavior of a statistic and others that are um, actually trying to model some real world phenomena and some that are basically both. Like, for example, the normal distribution is both a distribution that could be used to model real world phenomena and also a distribution that that is important to statistics describing the behavior of of certain statistics, which is also a discussion that we will be having in chapter five. Um, all right, so I just wanted to conclude on that. There's a lot of distributions out there. I find this chart rather interesting, um, but yeah, uh, if you wanted to, the Wikipedia art articles for particular distributions, uh, like maybe we could do, let's have a look at say, uh, the Wikipedia for article for, let's say, the normal distribution. Let's see. So Wikipedia has a number of articles for these uh, distributions, and they're generally pretty good. Um, they have a lot of information about them, um, where they're showing up, kind of what they're modeling, along with a lot of these uh, basic quantities that we would care about. Like, for example, what's the PDF, what's the CDF, what's the quantile function, uh, the mean, the median, the mode, the variance skewness and all this stuff so there's a lot of stuff that you can look at when you're um so it, 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 wikipedia might be a more modern version of that table that i have or, or that book that i have back in my office that's just tabulating a gazillion different distributions out there so yeah okay um i think i'm just gonna leave it at that and uh, I now truly don't have anything more to say for this uh, chapter. So have a good day.